Okay, so um, let's quickly review what we did last class. So last class we looked at uh, an important concept called linearity. Okay, so an element, uh, every element has a certain V to I relationship, and an element is called linear if it uh, if it conforms to the superposition principle. So superposition principle requires two. Uh, related uh, somewhat related uh, properties one is that uh, one is the first one f of x plus y is f of x plus f of y what is called the additive principle the other one is the homogeneity principle which is f of a x for some you know constant a should be the same as a times f of x okay so if uh, in general from mathematics if any of uh, i mean if both of these two are um, if both of these two properties are satisfied the function is linear similarly the electrical element is called linear if the V to I relationship satisfies the superposition principle. Okay, so of course resistor is V equals I R, uh, and uh, you can very easily show that the resistor, uh, 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 a resistor, all resistors are linear elements. And also turns out the derivative function is also a linear function. Okay, you can verify that for yourself. So capacitors and inductors are also linear elements. Now important thing to note voltage sources and current sources as we discussed last time are not linear elements because you require something very important from the V to Y characteristic. It's not just it needs to be a straight line, it needs to be a straight line passing through the origin. Okay, only then the superposition principle is valid. Okay, obviously if you have a current source or a voltage source whose value is non-zero it does not pass through the origin. Okay. Of course, if you have a current source or the voltage source, uh, if you have a voltage source, for example, whose voltage is zero, what is that? It's just a wire, right? It's just an ideal wire. So there is no voltage drop across it. Any current can pass through it. That is just a wire. Okay. So of course, that is linear. Okay. So the other important property we we learnt last time was memory. Okay. So we noted that inductors and capacitors have a derivative relationship or an integral relationship between the voltage and the current okay and if you express it in the integral relationship you can clearly see that the at any time t the voltage or the current in, in this particular case for the inductor the current depends on all the past voltages okay so it depends on the previous value of some or all previous values of the voltage. So therefore an inductor is an element with memory. Okay, You need to know the history of the voltage before you can calculate the current at any particular time. Okay. Similarly for the capacitor you can express the voltage as an integral uh, you know, uh, function of the current and you can show the same thing. Finally we also uh, at least I also pointed out that the V to I relationship for a for an element that we assumed. Remember, this is just a convention. We assumed that the current through any two terminal element flows from the terminal with higher voltage to the terminal with lower voltage inside the element. Okay. So this is what is called the passive sign convention. In today's class, we'll see why that is. So um, <coughs> we'll see a little bit more about this. And finally, we looked at what are called controlled sources. Okay. So now, so far what the sources, the voltage sources and current sources that we have been seeing are what are called independent sources. Okay. What that means is, you, uh, you know, you, if you have a voltage source of value, uh, some V0, okay. and it is for an ideal voltage source of value V0, its, its value is fixed for all time. Right. Whereas, you also have a class of sources called controlled sources whose voltage, uh, the voltage between a certain set of terminals depends on some other controlling variable. Okay? For a voltage controlled voltage source, the output voltage is related to the voltage between two sets of terminals. Okay? This could be, I have drawn it like this. In some cases, you will find that it is not drawn very explicitly like this. Okay, you may show this control source and you may just show it as some K times some VAB and VAB may be marked somewhere else in the circuit instead of just explicitly drawing these two lines like this. 
Okay, that is also possible. Similarly, you also have current control voltage sources, okay, where the controlling variable is a current. And you also have a voltage controlled current source where the control variable is a current and the controlling variable is a voltage. And finally, you also have a current controlled current source where the output current between two terminals depends on some input current. Some current flowing through a wire, okay, that is what we are talking about. Any questions on what we did last class? Okay, very good. The last and final point is the very important property of these kinds of control sources. You should always remember these are what are called unilateral elements. Okay. Unilateral elements, okay, in unilateral elements, the cause and effect relationship is only in a single direction, okay, whereas in other so called bilateral elements, okay, the cause and effect can be in both directions. Is that clear? So, control sources are one type of unilateral element. Okay, so far so good. So, in today's class, we will look at a couple of uh, different things. The first thing we will look at is another four terminal element, okay, to round out what uh, we have been uh, learning so far, is what is called a mutual inductor. Have any of you heard of this term or know what it means? Has any of you heard of this term mutual inductor or mutual inductance? Okay, so we will see what it means today. Okay, so as you can see from the symbol, so this is of course the symbol and I have drawn, you know, I have assumed a sign convention for V1, I1 and V2, I2. Okay, so of course from the name and the figure you understand it has something to do with inductance. Okay, so what is the property of a, so I have an, inductance L. So, what is the property of this inductance? What is the property of this inductance of an inductor? If I have a if I have a change time varying current, I will have a voltage developed across the terminals. Correct? Ok. So, I have some relationship between V and I. Right? For an inductor. So, suppose I take this obviously looks like two inductors, ok. So, let me just start off, ok, by saying V1 equals, ok. Of course, if I1, ok, is time varying, I will have a voltage V1 developed across the input terminals, ok. So, I will call this L1 and L2, L1 di1 by dt, ok. Similarly, V2 is L2 di2 by dt. Okay. So, I take two inductors, this is what I will have. Now, a mutual inductance, okay, is corresponds to a case where, so let us say I I pump a current I1 through an inductor. What happens? It sets up a magnetic field. If I set up a time varying current through the inductor, it sets up a time varying magnetic field. Okay, that will cause an induced voltage. Right? Suppose the flux from the uh, the flux from the due to the current I1, okay, somehow cuts inductor L2. Okay, so far you know the case where, you know the case for an independent inductor. Okay, so all the flux lines are associated, all the flux is associated with the inductor itself. Suppose some of the flux, okay, cuts the second inductor, any variation over time of I1, any di1 by dt can set up an induced voltage in L2. Okay, this can be a desired effect or an or an undesired effect. 
Okay, very possibly, if you just take two inductors and start bringing them closer in space, okay, you will always find some parasitic coupling between the two. Is that clear? If they are very far away, you don't care, right? They are very far away, you don't care. But if there is some spatial closeness between them, you will always find that the flux from one conductor will cut the other and vice versa by the way. If I set up a time varying current I2 okay, through L2 and part of the flux of that cuts L1, you will find that DI2 by DT will set up a voltage across the inductor L1. So in other words, in such a case, we say that the inductors are coupled inductors. Okay. As I pointed out, there are certain or there are actually many different kinds of electrical systems which exploit this property. This is an extremely important property okay, among inductors. Extremely important, extremely useful. Okay. So there are many cases where this is a desired effect, not just an not just an undesired effect. Okay. So what we'll do? We'll add a second term for V1 that also depends on DI2 by DT. Okay. Similarly, we'll add a second term to V2 that includes DI1 by DT. Okay. As you can see, if you have coupled inductors, okay, the voltage across the across each inductor depends on the current through both of them. Okay, so V1 and V2 depend on both I1 and I2. Rather, DI1 by DT and DI2 by DT. Any questions? Okay, how does it depend on the current through the other coils? So, as it turns out. It depends, we give it, uh, we call it by, it, uh, you know, by a variable M, which corresponds to mutual inductance. L is the, what is called the self-inductance of the coil. Okay, L is what is called the self-inductance of the coil. and M is what is called the mutual inductance between the coils. Okay? And as you can see, I have used the same variable M. Okay? You can show that if you have a set of, for such a system, if you have a set of coupled inductors, okay, the mutual coupling between L1 and L2 will be the same as the mutual coupling between L2 and L1. Okay? That can be easily shown. Okay? this is called reciprocity okay this kind of property is called reciprocity okay so now note that i have actually um, i have four terminals for this particular element okay and i have chosen a certain sign convention of course this we are used to correct Inside L1, I have current flowing from positive voltage to negative voltage, correct? Inside L2, I have or I also have I2 flowing from positive to negative voltage inside the element, okay? So far, so good. Now, suppose I had taken the I had taken the voltage and current conventions in the second inductor in L2 in this direction. Okay? Is this also consistent with the passive sign convention? It is. Okay, for L1 we have not changed anything. For L2 also the current is still flowing from 
positive to negative terminal. Obviously, there is some amount of ambiguity. Correct? There should there is some kind of ambiguity because we are changing the signs of the voltage and the current. Should be very clear that the voltage depends on right di2 by dt and similarly uh, both v1 and v2 depend on di2 by dt if you change the current uh, the direction of the current those signs will change right so what do you think will happen to the equation v1 what happens to the self inductance of v1 of course that will remain the same right is just an inductor similarly the self inductance portion of v2 will also remain the same okay obviously the signs of these will not change correct because as far as these two inductors taken separately are concerned inside the element you are following this passive sign convention very properly the problem comes due to the relative signs you have assumed for l1 and l2 not the absolute signs for the element itself is that clear what will happen to the second term earlier you had assumed the current direction i2 in the opposite direction you had said that was some uh, l1 v1 was l1 di1 by dt plus m di2 by dt what will happen in this case minus m di2 by dt similarly this will have minus m di1 by dt ok just see if the earlier case was uh, mutual inductance was positive now it will end up being negative because you have changed the direction of the current right ok so obviously there is some ambiguity so we need to resolve this right we need to be whatever system we follow both of these are okay right very clearly the passive sign convention is just a convention as long as you choose it it will work out fine but you need to have a convention because we are using symbols to represent these kinds of elements we need to be very consistent right so people have developed what is called the dot point convention okay you will always see whenever there is a set of coupled inductors you will always see a pair of dots okay it could be like this the coupled inductors could be drawn like this okay coupled inductors could be drawn like this or like this and so on okay sometimes they are drawn together this which is the most common way of doing it and other cases you will just see them drawn apart like this and then you will see a couple of a, a bidirectional arrow okay to show that they are coupled now very clearly it can be drawn with the dot points in multiple places okay these are two different the first two cases show the two possibilities okay so the dot point convention okay is very simple okay so the dot point convention says so this is just a symbol remember right this is just a symbol to tell you whether m is positive or negative okay so the convention for the dot point is that if you have or when you have currents entering the dot points both dot points okay this will produce such a situation will produce additive fluxes in other words the mutual inductance is positive okay
Okay, currents entering dot points produce additive fluxes. In other words, M is positive. Okay, so this is just a convention. So if you put the dot points in this way, okay, you can clearly tell whether M is going to be positive or negative depending on what direction the current takes. Is that clear? What happens if both currents are leaving the dot points? That will also produce additive fluxes. Okay? What will happen if one current is centering the dot point, other is leaving the dot point? That will produce a negative mutual inductance. Is that clear? Is that clear to everyone? Okay. So just follow this principle. If somebody gives you the dot point, okay, if you have both currents entering the dot point, M is positive. Okay? Very good. You will sometimes find that you will see these two arrows and you will see a K. Okay? A quantity K written next to it. Because this mutual coupling M can also be written as some k root L1, L2. Okay? Where k is called the coupling coefficient. k is called the coupling coefficient and you can show that the magnitude of k will always be less than or equal to 1. Okay? If the two inductances are very tightly coupled, okay, what is termed as tightly coupled, k will approach 1, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9 or 0 0.95 or something like that. When the inductors are loosely coupled, k may be a very small, uh, small value, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 and so on. Okay? If the two inductors are completely coupled, okay, k will be 1. If k is 1, mutual inductance is nothing but the geometric mean of L1 and L2. Is that okay? Okay, so... That kind of rounds out. Any questions on this mutual inductance? Any idea? Any idea of? Uh, do you think? Can you think of an example where mutual inductance is used? Transformers, right? I assume that's why I assume that most of you must have learned this some in some indirect way. What we are trying to learn is some of these conventions, and in a slightly more formal way, maybe. Right? That's all. Okay. Yeah. So as uh, as you know, this mutual inductance property is a you know, is the underpinning of many kinds of electrical systems. The transformer is the most common example. Okay? Okay, so... Let us look at this passive sign convention in a little bit more detail. So, we have been saying that for an... For any element, we have V, we have I, and we have been saying that this is some something called a passive uh, sign convention. So, any idea why it's called a passive uh, sign convention? What is passivity? So, this element, uh, you know, you have what are called passive elements, okay, in electricity, in electrical engineering, right? So, what is this passivity, and what is this passive sign convention? Any ideas? Okay. So for any element, okay, what is the power dissipated inside the element is V times I, you already know this. Okay, the power dissipated inside the element is V times I. Okay, if the directions of 
the currents and voltages are as shown. Okay, if you have the current flowing from the higher voltage to the lower voltage terminal inside the element, that means that the element is dissipating power. Okay. Is that clear? If you have an element where the current is flowing from the positive terminal, higher voltage to the lower voltage inside the element, okay, the element is dissipating power. Obviously, if the current is flowing in the opposite direction, as we have defined it, this power equals V times I will be negative. If either I or V turns out to be negative, okay, V times I will be negative, okay there is some negative power dissipated inside the element or power which is being generated by the element okay that should also be clear okay in case this number turns out to be negative it means that power is being generated inside the element okay this is of course power in watts anytime you write down a quantity you write down the units okay this is the power in watts okay so now a passive element okay is one where we will start off with this definition we will see if it is valid for everything a passive element is one where we will say power is dissipated in the element let us start off with the definition see if it is complete okay okay Okay, we will say power is dissipated. We will start off with this. It is not absolutely, it is not 100 percent correct. I will already tell you, uh, tell you that. Okay. Let us say I take a resistive element. Okay. Does it uh, dissipate power? If P V times I, is it positive or negative? Positive. So, I have a V. Okay. I have a current I, okay, equals V by R, okay, P is V times I, which is V squared by R or I squared R, okay, obviously V squared by R or I squared R is always positive, is always greater than 0, which means power is dissipated which means this is a passive element ok so the resistor is a passive element ok now let us say I take the case of a capacitor So the current through a capacitor is I times uh, is I which is C d V by dt. Okay. <laughs> what about the power? Is V times I? This is C V d V by dt. Okay. So this is a slightly different case from the resistor. Okay, in the case of the resistor it was very simple, you could decompose it into a quantity which showed you that, you know, the power was always positive. In this case, can the power be negative? Of course it can, right, because the current depends on dV by dt, okay, so dV by dt can actually be negative, right, dV by dt can actually be negative if the current entering the capacitor is some decreasing and uh, decreasing function of time let us say okay you can have dv by dt being negative okay so the power can be negative so is the capacitor a passive element or an active element so the opposite of a passive element is what is called an active element okay an active element is one that generates 
power. Okay, we'll start off with that definition. Now let us come back to this. So of course the power in the capacitor can be positive or negative. Okay. Now let us look at a different quantity. So far we have been looking at power. Let us look at the energy. Okay. What is the energy defined as? So, right? We will define it as the integral of the power. So, of course, okay, so now we have to go back. Okay. P of t, okay, is V of t times I of t. Power is an instantaneous quantity, okay. So it's V of t times I of t at any instant. That is P of t. Energy, on the other hand, is an integrated quantity, okay, which is nothing but integral P of t dt, okay. So I'll energy dissipated, okay over a time t naught okay is integral 0 to t naught p of t dt okay what is that for a capacitor so it's integral 0 to t naught so this is p of t so what is this This is half c into v squared of t naught minus v squared of 0. Isn't that right? Okay. You've already seen this, right? The energy stored in the capacitor is half c v squared. And if if you take a discharge capacitor, in other words, if v of 0 was 0, Okay, I just don't need to say this. If V of 0 was 0, okay, the energy dissipated is always greater than 0. Right? What does this mean actually? If V of 0 is 0, this means that you are actually taking a capacitor which is completely discharged. It has no voltage, no charge stored. Correct? Okay. Why do we say this um, energy is greater than zero? Dissipated energy is greater than zero. Because you actually have to spend some energy to charge the capacitor. You take a discharged capacitor. If you want to charge the capacitor, you actually have to spend some energy in charging the capacitor. How much energy do you need to spend? That is half CV squared. Right? Now, at a future time, this energy may, can be recouped. Right? You can actually take it back at a future time. However, the fact that the discharge capacitor needs to be charged before, okay, at least from an electrical point of view, this makes it a passive element. You still have to spend energy, okay, before you can use it. Okay, so this is slightly different from the case of the resistor, but it is still a passive element. Okay, so a capacitor is also a passive element because you still need to do energy to charge the capacitor. What about an inductor? You expect the same thing, just the variables are shifted, the current and voltage variables are shifted, instead of capacitance you have an inductance and so on. You can go through the same derivation which you have done here for the energy, okay? 
and what is the energy stored in an inductor? You already know this, it's half Li squared. So what you will actually get? Half L into Okay, you actually have to spend energy, assuming that I of 0 is 0, okay, you actually have to dissipate energy or spend energy to actually, I don't want to say charge the inductor, okay, but set up a, some energy stored inside the inductor, half Li square, charging is the wrong, uh, wrong usage, because you are not talking about charge. Because where, where does this energy go? It is stored in the magnetic field, right? The energy, just like in a capacitor, the energy is stored in the electric field. Okay, you are keeping charges apart, okay, creating a voltage and there is some energy stored. Okay, similarly, in the case of an inductor, the energy is stored in the magnetic field, okay, which can be reused later. So again, if I of 0 was 0, this inductor or all inductors will also be passive elements. Okay? So inductors will also be passive elements. So resistors, capacitors, inductors are all passive elements. Okay, then what kind of uh, elements are actually active elements? So what do you need? Uh, so far we've been saying passive element, okay, which is something where energy is dissipated. Now note that we've actually changed the definition slightly. We started off with power because it is very easy to set that up for a resistor, okay? A resistor always dissipates energy. You have a voltage, you have a current, V equals IR, R is positive, okay? Your convention works out beautifully. In the case of an inductor or a capacitor, you have to go a little bit, uh, you know, away from this to move to the definition based on energy. Okay. Now, of course, uh, I'm sure some of you will be thinking, what do you mean when you say energy is dissipated? Energy is, I mean, you learn right in like maybe third standard or first standard nowadays, energy is never created nor destroyed, you move from one type to another, right? So what is the problem here? Why do we say energy is dissipated or destroyed? Huh? Okay. Consumed, where does it go? Huh? What losses? Where does it go? Energy, you know that energy is never created or destroyed, right? So where does it go? It's not lost or... Uh, you know energy is always converted from, converted from one form to another. So when we say things like this, energy is dissipated or energy is generated, what we are actually talking about is electrical energy. Because we are dealing with electrical quantities, okay? We very specifically mean electrical energy is dissipated. Obviously, you take a resistor, okay, you, you know, pass a current through it, it is dissipating energy, but that energy is, electrical energy is being converted to some other form, right? Most probably heat, right? It's not that the energy is lost forever. An active element is one where electrical energy is generated. Of course, again the same, you know, caveat holds. We mean electrical energy is generated and an example of an active element is a voltage source or a battery. You very clearly know that it has, any battery has stored chemical energy inside it which is actually converted to electrical energy. Okay, so as far as we are concerned, we are dealing only with electrical quantities, right? So therefore, we are interested in whether electrical energy is generated or destroyed. And that is where this definition comes from. Okay? 
Any questions? So if I have a voltage V, yes. Yes. No, it is not because to actually see, we are interested in the ultimate source and destruction of electrical energy, right? If you have a charged capacitor, it may actually look like an active element because it is it actually has energy stored in it. But to actually store the energy in it, you actually have to spend energy from somewhere else. Okay, you can actually use a battery to charge a capacitor, but that much energy has been removed from the battery. Okay, so. A, a charged capacitor may look like a battery or may look like a source of energy for a specific amount of time. Okay? But obviously you have to spend electrical energy to do this. Okay? Same thing with an inductor. Okay? So again, if you take a voltage source, okay, or a current source, Okay, you can define power as V times I for both. So, will V times I be positive or negative for a battery? For a so let's let's take the example of a voltage source. Will it be positive or negative? For a resistor, it is positive. Okay, for a capacitor which is being charged, it is positive. For an inductor where the magnetic field of flux is being set up, it is positive. What about a battery? It can be positive or negative. Okay? How do you figure that out? Because what is the property of an ideal voltage source? An ideal voltage source man maintains a certain voltage, let us say this was some V equals V naught. It maintains a voltage V naught irrespective of what current flows through this element. Correct? So the current could even be a negative current flowing in the opposite direction. It does not matter. Okay? So the power dissipated in the element could be either positive or negative. And it is exactly the same case for a current source also. Okay? And that you should clearly be able to see if you draw the IV characteristics for these these kinds of elements. For the elements for which you can draw it easily. Let's take the simplest case of a resistor. This is the IV curve for a resistor. Okay? passing through the origin, okay, it spans the first and third quadrants, okay, in the first quadrant both I and V are positive, in the third quadrant both I and V are negative, so of course a, a resistor always has VI equals VI being positive, okay, so therefore a resistor is definitely a passive element and it always dissipates power, okay. If I take the case of a current source, Okay, current source of value I naught. It spans the first and second quadrants. Okay, in the first quadrant, it dissipates power. In the second quadrant, so in this quadrant, in this quadrant it dissipates power. Okay, and in this quadrant it generates power. Okay, that depends on what voltage is being set up across the current source by something else. Okay, remember the property of a current source is that it just forces a current I to flow between the terminals. It does not say anything about the voltage. The voltage across it will be decided by something else. Is that clear? And similarly for a voltage source, okay, the current through it will be decided by something else, maybe the rest of the circuit. Okay, the what its property is to hold a voltage, a specific voltage across its terminals. Okay, so similarly if you take a voltage source, okay, 
if you take a voltage source in the first quadrant it dissipates power in the fourth quadrant it generates power okay of course I have, you can also take the case of I not being negative okay or V not being negative but you will see that it always occupies two quadrants where in one quadrant it will generate power in the other quadrant it will dissipate power okay any questions okay What about a mutual inductor? <laughs> Do you think it's active or passive? So we have seen all the basic elements. What about a mutual inductor? Is it an active element or a passive element? Huh? Passive. Why is that? If you take what inductance? Self inductors. Self inductors. Okay. Plus, uh, times m. Okay. Plus m times uh, d i two by d t. Two by d t. Two. Correct. So, no. Of course, just as the case where with the capacitor and the inductor you cannot use power, you will have to use energy, right? Now, what is your gut feeling about this? What is your gut feeling about whether this is active or passive? Well, very clearly, a mutual inductance is similar to a normal inductor wherein the energy is stored in a magnetic field. It just so happens that this, the magnetic field is such that the flux cuts, the flux from one cuts the other and vice versa. Right? If you don't have, if you don't set up the magnetic field, if you don't have any stored energy, okay, the, it cannot give you any energy by itself. Right? So, your gut feeling should tell you that this is also a passive element. Now the only question is, how do you define power or energy for this, okay? In this case, this is a four terminal device, you have not encountered this before, we have seen only two terminal elements. For two terminal elements, we just defined it as V1 I1, okay, or VI. In this case, you have two sets of voltages and currents, so it will be V1 I1 plus V2 I2. Okay, inherently I, you know, inherently V1 also depends on I2 and V2 also depends on I1. Okay, so this is the power, you can derive the energy from this, now I'm, I want you to do this as a homework. Okay, derive the expression for energy based on this, you know the expression for V1 and V2, derive the expression for energy, okay, similar to what we did for the self inductance. Okay, you should get some half Li squared kind of number, but you may have some additional terms. So find out the total energy. Okay, and I want all of you to do this in time for tomorrow's class. Okay.